afternoon. Welcome to the College of Engineering's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Philip De Leon. On April 10th last year, in coordinated press conferences across the globe, researchers revealed that they had succeeded in unveiling the first direct visual evidence of a supermassive black hole in its shadow. National Science Foundation Director Franz Cordova said, this is a huge day in astrophysics, and we're seeing the unseeable. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Shale. Dr. Shale grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and became fascinated with radio astronomy after a visit to the Very Large Array in Socorro. In 2013, he received his BA in Physics from Carleton College in Minnesota. After college, he started graduate school at Harvard University, where he joined the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration and focused his thesis work on producing and understanding the first images of black holes at event horizon scales. He received his PhD from Harvard just this last year, where he also received the Eric Quito Prize in Theoretical Physics, Astrophysics for his dissertation. Dr. Shale is currently a NASA Hubble Fellowship Program postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University, where he is continuing his work on understanding what images of supermassive black holes from the ETH can tell us about black holes, hot plasma, and their interactions. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Andrew Shale. Yeah, thank you so much for um, inviting me, and it's really great to be back in New Mexico to give this talk. Um, before I get started, I just want to say that this is a talk that really represents the work of hundreds of people over many years. Um, this is a picture of the EHT collaboration at one of our recent meetings. Um, we have members in countries around the globe. One of the great stuff about this work is just being able to go to conferences and meet people from all around the world. It's a really international effort, and so I just want to highlight that nothing that is talked about in this talk is really my work, and really any individual work um, wants work in this talk, in this group. Um, so the motivating question behind the EHT, this event horizon telescope that produced this image of a supermassive black hole that um, maybe many of you saw last year, is what does a black hole look like? And this might sound like a really paradoxical question. I mean, like black holes are supposed to be really dark. That sort of defines them is that they can, light can't escape. So like, what what would an image of a black hole look like? What does that even mean? Um, and so to understand that, we can go back to, to Einstein and the first publication of the theory of general relativity. And one of the things that Einstein's theory predicted um, which was surprising and unique, and ultimately what was one of the things that convinced people that it was um, a valid theory of nature, was that light should be bent by gravity. That if you have the sun here, for example, um, and a distant star, that light going nearby the gravitational field of the sun will be bent as it approaches the star. And this was one of the, the observation of this in the eclipse was one of the things that convinced people that um, general relativity was correct. And taken to its extreme, um, in the Schwarzschild solution of a, uh, of a black hole, basically what this, what this gives you is that there's a certain radius at which if matter is compacted so far inside of it that even light cannot escape it, the light will be bent so far trying to get out of it that it won't be able to and it will inevitably fall back. And so you have this standard picture where the sun exerts some, like, some gravitational force, light gets bent a little bit, or in a neutron star light will get bent a lot, but around the black hole light will be trapped. Um, and this happens at a critical radius called the Schwarzschild radius. Um, so this, this gives us the picture that black holes are trapping light, that they don't, that light um, near a black hole will be, will be trapped and we'll be able to see it at all. Um, and one of the ways that we know black holes exist, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for them that we have right now, is actually not in light, but sort of in, in sound, or in the sound of um, gravitational waves um, through space. And so um, just a few years ago, in 2015, we heard for the first time this collision of two black holes um, uh, the, the LIGO interferometer um, experiment was able to hear the ripples in space-time um, that are emitted as two black holes spiral in toward each other and emit these, these waves. Um, and we've seen this many times now throughout, um, the, throughout the universe. And actually, we have this sort of whole catalog of, of black holes that we're building up. And these are all sort of black holes around the ranges of, of the mass of the sun, um, or tens of times the mass of the sun, up to 40 or 50. 60 or 70 times the mass of the sun. And these we're hearing sort of now, if you follow LIGO on Twitter, they, follow, they release a new one, um, like a new, they hear a new black hole colliding with another black hole like every week now, it's crazy. Um, but in terms of like, that's, that's sort of in sound, or in the analogy of sound um, for, for, for gravitational waves. What, what would we see 
a black hole to look like. So we can imagine that if we had light somehow being emitted around a black hole, that some of that light would fall in. Um, there's a radius at which light will fall inside the black hole, but some of it will just be bent. And if we're at a distant observer here, I don't think we have two eyes, but <laughs> um, and the distant observer will see, um, see this light that can escape around the black hole, but this light um, inside that it falls into the black hole, we won't see. And so this will produce a shadow of the black hole on top of whatever light is being emitted behind it. So the light behind, some, some of the light behind uh, to the side can escape, some of the light behind is bent around, but all this light in front will fall into the black hole, leaving this shadow. And this is the prediction of, um, that comes out of general relativity that this shadow should be this size. So the diameter should be two times the square root of 27 times the gravitational radius, the mass of the um, black hole times these fundamental constants. So this is the thing that we tried to go out and, and look at with the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, but to, to have this, we have to have something around the black hole that produces this light, that um, lights up the space-time around the black hole. And so what, what is this that lights up the, the, the black hole? And it turns out that actually it's not surprising that light should be emitted around the black hole because black holes are some of the most efficient engines for generating energy and releasing light in the universe. And so you can just see that by looking at how much gravitational energy will a particle, if you throw like a baseball into a black hole, how much energy uh, does it pick up from accelerating in the gravitational field um, as it goes, um, falls all the way in toward the object? Um, and this is just the gravitational potential energy, and if you take it all the way down to the, the Schwarzschild radius, which is really, really small, you get this relationship of the energy um, that is released um, by this particle um, becomes uh, to half of its rest mass. So half of the E equals mc squared of the particle would be released and is theoretically available to turn into light that we see. In contrast, for nuclear fusion, that's only um, less than a percent. So actually, accretion of material onto black holes, uh, because this short shield radius is so small compared to like the radius of the Earth or the radius of a star, um, is actually incredibly efficient at liberating energy. A lot of that can go into light that we produce um, and generate um, and generates this image that we actually observed last year. And we see this throughout the universe um, in the centers of galaxies. We think now that almost all galaxies have supermassive black holes that lie in their centers. And these actually produce an incredible amount of light just from material gas falling onto it and heating up to incredible temperatures and releasing huge amounts of, of radiation. And sometimes, not exactly in this picture, but we see this bright light in the center of the galaxy. Um, in some, some galaxies, um, the light that's emitted just by this one object in the center can outshine every single star in the entire galaxy. Um, and for a long time, this was something that confused a lot of people when they first saw, saw these, and was one of the um, strongest evidence that we have for um, these extragalactic sources. Um, so if we could zoom into the center of that galaxy and look at this really bright emitting material around the black hole, what we would see is light bent around um, the, the gra by the gravity of the black hole. It's, um, the light uh, that is emitted by this bright gas is, is bent. Um, and we see this, this formation of the shadow feature that we saw in a simple example. And this is actually what a modern simulation of the same process would show. So you can see that there's this bright gas that's um, emitted directly. We see swirls of this spiraling in gas. We also see this, this shadow um, that's caused by the bending of light as it's lensed around the black hole several times. And the radius of the shadow is the same as in the simple example that we showed earlier. And so if you want to go actually and look at this, most black holes are, are too far away. And so where, where can we find a black hole that's big enough that we might actually be able to see this feature, um, this, the shadow of the black hole on top of the gas, of the emitting gas that's, that's, that's lighting up the space-time around it? And one of the most promising places to look is in the, uh, in the center of our own galaxy, where there's a source called Sagittarius A star, um, which is the nearest supermassive black hole that we know about. And so we know that there's a supermassive black hole there because if we look at stars um, going around um, we look at stars in the center of the galaxy in this region uh, here. We see um, them orbit over years, and people have tracked these stars now over decades and seen them go through full orbits around some mysterious central mass, which we can't see. There's no, nothing there at the center that, that's shining brightly. Um, and so it's not some giant star that's tracking them, and we think that this is, uh, we, we can calculate based on, the, um, based on these orbits that this, this mass is four million times the mass of the sun. And if we look at it in the radio, we see there's this blob of emission. This is the highest resolution image we currently have of the center of the galaxy. Um, and it's really compact. And we think that this blob is um, it's only a few times the expected um, ring that we expect to see. We think this blob is really the gas around the supermassive black hole. And if we can look, this is a little bit better resolution. We'll be able to see this 
this ring. Um, and there's another source that was actually the one that we observed um, last year. Uh, it's not in the center of our galaxy, but the center of the galaxy called M87, which is this um, elliptical uh, galaxy um, that emits this, this powerful jet. And actually, this jet um, was first observed 100 years ago. And this was the first um, jet of material that was um, observed in space. And it's actually the, this is a really common feature that we see all over the place now. And if we look in radio, we see that this jet uh, is, is taking material out of the center of the galaxy and spreading it to huge distances. So some, some material is coming out, it's being ejected in this really narrow pencil-thin jet, and then it's coming out of the galaxy and coming out into these huge clouds. And if we zoom into the jet, we can see this goes all the way to the center. So this is on the scale of here, thousands of light years. And here we're on the scale of less than a light year. Um, and we can follow this jet all the way in. And so at the very center of this jet, we think that what's launching it is a supermassive black hole of the same type that we see in the center of our own galaxy, so just a thousand times more massive. And so just to give some perspective, if we just look at this figure I showed before, all these black holes that LIGO is seeing, things that are caused by the collapses of stars, sort of in the ranges of 10 times to 50 times the mass of our own sun, if we were to extend this figure, um, we can give a sense of how big the black hole in the center of M87 is. Um, and this isn't actually to scale. If it were to scale, this would be like a mile across. So it's really, really big. Um, so because it's really, really big, the shadow that we see is also really, really big. If we can just calculate the radius of the shadow, it turns out that this black hole is about as big as our solar system. It's many times the 650 AU. Um, AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it's, the size of this thing is enormous compared to the size of the, uh, the scales we're familiar with in the solar system. But it's also really, really far away, 50 million light years away. So if we just think about how big that would be as an angle on the sky, that's like 10 billionths of a degree. It's extremely small. So if you measure in this unit, um, this tiny unit we call micro arc seconds, um, the, this, the, the feature we're trying to look at is about this big, 40 micro arc seconds across. And just to give some sense of how small that is, if we look at the Hubble Space Telescope, and we look at one pixel on the camera of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a really good telescope, the, um, able to look at a really lot of fine structure. We zoom in, this is how big our image is. So it's much, much smaller than a single pixel on this really, um, really sensitive telescope. Another way of thinking about it is that this black hole shadow feature you want to look at, and this is a simulation showing sort of the evolution of material around it. So we think that the material that's lighting up the space time um, in the black hole is actually moving really fast, and so it's orbiting, and we, see, we should be able to see the, this evolution um, over time. This black hole shadow is actually about the same size as an orange on the surface of the moon, if we were to look at it now. Um, and that's another <laughs> sense of scale. Here's like a really fine um, <laughs> picture of a moon. This is like a, about, about as good as you can get from the moon from the ground. Um, if we have a ground-based telescope, this is about the best you can do um, for um, how taking a picture of the surface of the moon. And each pixel in here is 1.5 million oranges. So <laughs> this is a really hard task to, to see something this small on the sky and to, to take a picture of it. And so in astronomy, we know that the diffraction limit tells us how big our telescope has to be um, in order to um, see something that's of a specific size. If the angular, if we decrease the observing wavelength, we can get um, higher angular resolution this number goes down to 40 microseconds. If we increase the size of the telescope, we can see finer and finer features as well. And it turns out if we plug, plug in the numbers, um, using the wavelength that we expect most of the emission to be emitted at um, for, for the sources we're looking at, um, we need a telescope that's about the size of the Earth to take the picture of this. And um, the NSF is giving us a lot of money, but they're not going to give us that much money. Um, <laughs> it turns out that even with this um, resolution, this, these sort of perfect simulations that we see, we're just barely able to make it out. So we're, the image is not, we don't have perfect resolution goggles. We only are limited by how big our telescope is. Um, and with an Earth-sized telescope, we're just able to make out this uh, outline of the, of the black hole shadow um, in, the, in, in, these, in these sources. But the central feature, which is this ring of emission, um, is still apparent, even with this uh, lower resolution that we expect with the Earth-sized telescope. If you think about how we can actually construct an Earth-sized telescope, since we can't actually stick this thing onto the Earth, um, the way that a telescope works is basically that, or a radio dish in this case, is that the radio dish acts as a mirror. And so light comes in, 
um, from different rays from the black hole and is combined at the focus. And so it all bounces together and is combined here. Um, so what we basically do is to do the same thing by taking the light and essentially, some people say we like freeze the light, we record it um, at individual telescopes across the surface of the Earth and then combine it later inside a computer. And so we're basically getting the, the, the separation of a single dish the size of the Earth that enables us to see fine scale structure. But of course, we're not getting everything that a dish the size of the Earth would give us. We can't reconstruct the entire image because we're only looking at certain individual um, points along the surface of the Earth where we have telescopes. And these are the telescopes <coughs> of the Event Horizon Telescope that have been um, used in the last um, observing run to, to put together an image of the supermassive black hole. So we have telescopes in Hawaii, in Mexico, Chile, one at the South Pole, um, in France, in Spain, um, in Arizona. Um, we're adding another telescope in Arizona this year, and then um, in Greenland, which we're adding this year as well. And it's really, again, not the individual telescope of this array. No single telescope is taking the picture of the black hole that we observe, but it's by combining them together into a network, and by using the fact that the separations between these telescopes are, are really big and span the size of the Earth that we're able to take this picture. I'm going to sort of explain why, how this works. Um, basically, the fundamental thing you should know about very long baseline interferometry, which is what this technique is called, is that it's not sampling the image of a black hole directly, like we have here, but it's actually sampling of the image Fourier transform. And so the Fourier transform of the image is basically a way of decomposing it into spatial frequencies. So you have frequencies, in this case, on east-west and north-south, and it's just another representation of the image. And this is the thing that we're actually sensitive to. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Fourier transform, basically the way to think about it is in this 1D example, we have a, a waveform here, like we have some complicated wave, and we can split this wave up into combinations of different sine waves. So we have different pure waves here, and we add them all together to get this complicated thing. The Fourier transform is just telling us how much of each of these waves we need to add together to get this complicated thing. Um, in this case, this is in time, but you can think about it for the image as we're really just taking the the, the same signals, um, not in time, but in spatial position here. And so we get this two-dimensional Fourier transform instead of this one-dimensional Fourier transform. And so this is what we're fundamentally sensitive to with interferometry. So we have two telescopes um, separated um, by some large distance on the Earth, and each pair of telescopes, or baseline as we call it, um, gives us one measurement of this Fourier transform. So one frequency of the image. So if we break the image up into uh, to an infinite combination of these individual waves, basically, each of these um, telescopes gives us one, um, one component of this sum of different waves. And if we had telescopes that covered the entire Earth, we'd be able to sample every single one of these different modes. And so we'd be able to just instantly get our image, because this is basically giving us the exact same information um, as just the image itself. But we don't have telescopes that cover the entire Earth. What we have is a sparse collection of telescopes. And we get some more information. And we get some more information as the Earth rotates. Um, and so as the Earth rotates, different telescopes come into view and different um, connections, different <coughs> baselines between these telescopes are added to our network. And we add, combine this into the, into, the, into the spatial frequency plane here. Um, this is supposed to be filling out, but sorry. <laughs> But basically, as, yeah, as, we, as the Earth rotates, different combinations are added, and this plane starts to fill out, but it fills out to be to much more sparse than just this, um, this large filled disk. It's a, it's a small number of points that, that fill this plane that we have to work with. Um, so this is the same, um, if you've ever been to the, to the Very Large Array, like one of the best telescopes in the world that's a, not that far from here, up in Socorro, um, it's the same basic principle that um, <coughs> that undergirds the VLA and the EHT. So this is a technique that people have been using for a really long time. You're taking telescopes, I um, mean, you're using the separations between those telescopes instead of each individual telescope to, to create the image. And you're combining them together into a network um, to get better resolution than any single one of those telescopes would have by itself. Um, so this is a really well-established technique, but what the, it's so difficult about the EHT and what makes it much harder um, to, to work with than, than, than instruments like the VLA that people have been using for decades um, is that we have many, many fewer dishes, for one, so we have a lot less data to work with in trying to, to, to go from this data that we measure um, to an actual image. Um, these 
are separated by much larger distances, and so the, sort of the technical problem of recording the data and combining it becomes much harder. Um, we can't, like at the VLA, all these telescopes are just wired, there are wires between them. Um, here, we have to record data and then um, ship it back. Um, and we work at really high frequencies, um, so um, in m basically in microwave frequencies, but the atmosphere starts to become a problem. Um, and this is really one of the biggest problems that we have, is that um, the high frequencies we look at, the atmosphere is really messing with our signal. And so that, that really enters into our into all the difficulties that we have. Okay. So I'm just going to mention sort of the process by which we went through to, to reconstruct the image um, from, the, from the data we took in 2017. Um, and I'll start with the observations. So in 2017, we observed um, with this network of sites. Um, so we have the south, the sub millimeter telescope in Arizona, uh, Pico Valeta in Spain, the large millimeter telescope in Mexico, um, the SMA uh, and JCMT telescopes in um, Mauna Kea and Hawaii. Uh, the Apex Telescope and Alma Telescope in Chile, um, and then the South Pole Telescope, which is at the South Pole. And um, we observed with all these telescopes in April of 2017. Um, amazingly, we had really good weather the entire week of our observations, which is really rare to get really good weather at all of these different places um, in the Earth at one time. It's a really fortuitous thing. It did not happen in 2018. We had really bad weather at some of the sites, and we observed again. And these are some pictures of the people um, who, who did this observation and went out to these sites um, and during, that, during that week in 2017 to take this data. And you can imagine this is a really complicated logistical hassle because all these telescopes have other jobs that they're doing 99% of the time. They weren't built for the EHT. Um, we're just sort of renting them. We have to sort of rent them all at the same time um, all over the world to you know, take them over. Um, if we have to convince people to let us do that, we have to convince people to let us use them at a certain time, and we have to all get them ready to go at the time that the weather is good everywhere. So that becomes a really complicated task. In addition, we have to install, um, oh, and then I am mostly a theorist, and I don't go to telescopes, unfortunately. So I sat here in the control room, control room um, and um, gave people moral support as, <laughs> <laughs> as they've been out into this work. Um, um, so we, don't, we didn't build these telescopes. They were built for other purposes. But one of the things that uh, people in the HD collaboration spent a long period of time doing for many years was to build back-end um, uh, electronics to record the data and put it into a format that we could use um, and was uniform across all the telescopes that we could use. Um, and so we, they built these um, really sophisticated um, um, electronics racks which digitize the signal. Um, so we basically have this complicated signal where we have the electric, incoming electric field measured at each telescope. Um, we sample it to two bits two-bit sequence, and then we sample it at a really fast rate. So these each individually record data um, onto disk at eight gigabytes per second. Um, we accumulate an enormous amount of data. Uh, here's my colleague Katie Bowman with 64 terabytes of our data. Um, at the end of the day, we ended up with like five petabytes of data across the entire observation. And then we ship it all to a central facility to combine it all so that we take, we can extract the signal that we're really measuring, which is not the electric field um, measured at one telescope, but the correlation of the electric field that we measure between one telescope and another telescope far away on the Earth. And so the way this works is basically in this cartoon picture um, that the light comes in from the black hole. It's measured at all these different telescopes across the Earth and recorded onto our hard drives. Um, those hard drives are shipped to a central facility that then um, plays these back and looks for the correlations between these different signals measured at different sites. Um, once those correlations are measured, um, we have to calibrate them. And so these correlations are really, they start out really weak. And so we have to calibrate them and find the exact combination of parameters um, that, um, that measures their, that can maximize their strength and measure the interference pattern. And then we, that gives us a collection of a sparse amount of data that we then put into image reconstruction algorithms, um, which lock onto the sky image um, that best matches this data, the small amount of data that we've been able to extract from these massive amounts of um, data that was recorded at the telescopes. And so just to give a sense of like how much data we're talking about here, um, the raw signal we measure at the telescopes is, um, is measured in petabytes. But then by the time we correlate it and calibrate it, we've really gone down to megabytes. Um, and the final image that we extract after this calibrated data is only a few kilobytes. So really, we're looking for a needle in a huge haystack of data that we measure all this stuff at the telescope, which uh, most of which is noise that we see locally. We're trying to extract what the small amount of information we have 
from the actual black hole is in this data. It's a, it's a 12 orders of magnitude um, reduction in the amount of data from what we record at individual telescopes to what we produce as an image. Okay, so to talk a little bit about the imaging problem, um, basically what I mentioned before was that we have all these different telescopes and they sort of carve out little tracks in the space of the Fourier transform. So we, each of these different um, comp, uh, pairs of telescopes gives us one point on this plot. Um, and if we had every single point on this plot, we'd be able just to in see the image in immediately. But we don't have every single point. We have just this small number of points. Um, and the, the points that we have are determined by what the geography of our sites are, how where they're separated gives us each of these points. And as it rotates, each of these points sort of becomes a little curve, but that helps us a little bit, but not enough to fill out this space and give us all the information we would need to instantly solve for the image. So instead of being able to just invert and instantly solve for the image, we need to run this sparse amount of data through an algorithm to give us a sense of what of all of the infinite number of images um, Yeah, so I was going to say, um, if, if we had all of this data, we could just do an inverse Fourier transform and instantly get the image. Um, but we can't do that. We have a sparse amount of data, so we have an infinite number of images which could explain this sparse amount of data. And so to pick from all these infinite number of images which could explain the limited amount of data that we, we have, we have to run it through some sort of algorithm that gives us a sense of what the most likely image is um, of all of these infinite possibilities um, that explains the data. So maybe all of these different images down here in the corner do a good equal job of explaining the data. But we would have some sense that this static image here isn't really a likely image because it probably has to conspire in some very strange way to explain the data. Whereas this image here, which looks more like something we expect to see on space, it's compact, um, it's not um, it's not static or, or really extended noise. And so we might prefer this one and think that one's a more likely image and use that um, prior assumption as something that informs our selection of these images. And in addition to uh, the fact that our measurements are sparse, we also have to deal with the fact that they're noisy, and in particular the fact that we have this atmosphere, um, it's an annoying atmosphere on Earth, um, <laughs> that <laughs> corrupts all of our signals and um, makes um, make basically means that we lose a lot of information that we would normally have. So if, if we were looking at a lower frequency like the one that the VLA observes at, we would have a lot more information to work with. We actually lose a lot of that just because the atmosphere messes it up. Um, and so we have to work with less, with even, even less information than in the ideal case where we had the whole um, one. So I won't get into the details of this. Um, there are basically two um, different approaches we took to, to uh, for these algorithms to solve um, for these different, uh, to solve for these images. Um, but just to say that like one of the techniques that we did was sort of the standard approach that was done in the field um, for a really long time. So since the 1970s, basically, this algorithm has worked really well on arrays like, like the VLA, um, like the Alma array in Chile. Um, but uh, when, when we push it to this extreme for the EHT and we look at these really sparse data, and we look at these data where we're missing a lot of the information that we might normally have for a normal array, um, it actually becomes really, really difficult to use. It's this clean approach where basically it goes, um, basically what we're doing is we're trying to clean up the image. Um, we, we, saw, we just invert the Fourier transform, we get a really messy image, and we just try to clean it up. Um, that's a really schematic way of, of explaining it. Um, that approach doesn't, doesn't really work well as well for the EHT, though we've actually had a lot of success um, by experts in our field in developing extensions to this approach that, that have really uh, pushed it to, to, to be able to produce images um, that work for the EHT. So we combine this with a new approach, or a newer class of approaches that um, I worked on a lot, um, that people um, in um, our, my group um, in grad school worked on a lot, um, which are more forward modeling approach. So basically we take a candidate image in this approach and we put it through like a model of our telescope and we see what data would predict. We compute a probability that the data would be produced um, by that image, the data that we observe, the real data would be produced by that image. And then we also have a prior probability that any image could be is, is likely to, to be the, uh, the correct description of the black hole. And this prior probability will throw away images like that static image we saw earlier, um, but it will favor images that are that have some certain features, like maybe they're compact, maybe they um, are in the same sort of size range that we expect, maybe they have the right amount of total emission. And this is a really nice approach because we can fold in a lot of these different 
um, difficulties that make the traditional approach hard into these probabilities, things like the systematic errors and the phase error um, and, and, and things of that nature. So we, we have these two different approaches, and I think one of the things that was really key for the EHT across all of our, not just in this imaging step, but across our entire analysis, was that we had all these different ways of attacking the same problem. And so we didn't just look, take one algorithm and try to um, apply it to the data and say, okay, here's our answer. We looked at all these different approaches and we said, what is the consistent story are these all telling us? What are the pros and cons of each of these algorithms? What um, is the consistent message that they're all telling us? Because that's the one we're most likely to believe. Um, and so that's basically, we had this result, we ran it through our algorithms, we had the data, we ran it through our algorithms, we got this result, and we want to know how do we verify what we're constructing for real? This is a really big um, claim that we're trying to make, that we're seeing the shadow of a black hole. We want to make sure that we're saying it with 100% confidence. And so the first step that we did to, to give ourselves this confidence was we did this blind imaging step. Um, so basically here we broke up into four different teams, um, and these teams were sort of subdivided a little bit by geographical area. Um, we had our collaborators from Europe, from East Asia, from um, around the world, and we um, also divided the teams up um, by different algorithms. So um, there wasn't an, a particular um, rule that you had to use one algorithm or another, but in general, teams one and two used this newer class of algorithms, and teams four and three used the more traditional method. And so we divided these teams up, and we worked on the problem independently um, for seven weeks. So we, the teams were not allowed to communicate with each other in this period. We talked to each other either inside the team, but we weren't allowed to have any communication or um, share all what we were working on. We just got the data, and we worked on it with our own methods. And then seven weeks later, we um, had put together what we thought was the most, our best image that we had generated as a team, and we went to compare them. And we saw this. Um, so this was one of the really most exciting moments uh, I had in um, my life, but also in graduate school. Um, and um, basically, you know, these images aren't the final image. There's still uncertainties we've had to work out from, from this stage, but really just um, each team with completely different methods or um, with, with different combinations of methods is able to reconstruct the same ring and we've seen the same answer. And this was the image that each team had the most confidence in. Um, and so the details are different and we refined them as we've been along and we made our procedure better. But the main story of just this, this ring um, was the takeaway. The shadow of the black hole was persistent in all of these images. And so we had a lot of confidence just after seeing this. But then after we um, did, this is all of us at that initial unveiling, we just averaged the images together here. Um, it's a really good day. Um, <laughs> so the, um, after we did that initial comparison, we wanted to um, push our algorithms to the, to the limit and to see how can we possibly make these algorithms break? Is there anything we're possibly missing here? Because all these algorithms have lots of different knobs that we can turn to, right? But there's no one answer. All of them have a lot of different inputs. There's a lot of different um, um, weights and different things that you can adjust as you run the algorithm. And we have a lot of exper expertise built up with how to do this, but how, is there a way that we can actually test this more systematically? And so what we did in this step was we ran um, our three different imaging pipelines, and one of them was one that I worked on and wrote during my thesis. Um, and we took these three different pipelines um, and we took all of their different knobs that we could vary and we just ran them on a huge grid of parameters that, um, that vary across this, a huge amount of parameter space. So basically, we um, took our, and we tested this on a whole set of synthetic data that we were worried that maybe our image is one of these sources that is um, pretending to be this ring that we see. So maybe it's this filled disk, or maybe it's this double source. Maybe it's this ring with uniform brightness. One of the things that we actually really focus on is that the R ring that we see in the data is has a bright, has a bright spot in the south and isn't equally bright all around. Um, so we generate synthetic data from all these different models. We put them through our imaging methods with a huge number of choices of these parameters. We tested thousands and thousands of these parameter combinations, and we selected the ones that did the best job of distinguishing between all of these different images. So that if we took any one of these images and we ran it through a, an imaging method with some combination of the parameters, we'd be confident that we got the right answer out as to which of these um, sources it was. And then that, that's the, though that subset is what we applied to the real M87 data to get these images, to get what were our final images. 
So at the end of the day, what we had was three different imaging algorithms um, across four different days of observation. We had um, independent observations on four days in April. And we got these, this final grid of images, which you can see still has the consistent rain um, in all of them. The algorithms aren't identical. They have different you know, strengths and weaknesses. They look for different things in the data. So sometimes the, the small scale features of these images aren't identical. Hopefully in the future, we'll be improving uh, the quality of our data. We'll be adding more telescopes. We'll be able to beat down on what these, um, the exact um, structure on small scales is. But the large scale ring um, is consistent across all of them. So for the final image, what we did was we just averaged, we blurred all these images to the equivalent resolution, and then we just averaged them together into a final image that really represents the work of not just one single imaging algorithm, but really the combination of all of these methods that was put together um, across the collaboration, um, and that really gave us the confidence that what we were seeing um, was a real feature uh, that shadowed the black hole in MIT 7. And this is a feature we saw across four different days. So this is also, I think, another really strong piece of evidence in favor that this uh, feature is real. We went back on different days. It didn't go away. It's not some calibration error in one, in one day of data. It um, persists across all days. And of course, a, r a real test will come when we um, observe it again this year. And we go back and see, is what we see in that observation consistent? So stay tuned for that. OK, so in the last part of the talk, I'm just going to talk briefly about like what does this image tell us? So we've gone through this whole process of putting together telescopes across the world to, um, into a network, uh, designing algorithms to take the data from that network and produce an image, um, and, and testing those algorithms to the max and producing this, this image um, that we stand behind. Um, what can we learn from this image that we've spent all this time producing? And so one of the most simple things we can learn um, straight away um, that has really been a puzzle in M87 for a long time, was what is the mass of this black hole? So people had looked at the, people had you know, known there was a black hole there for a long time. They had tried to infer the mass of it through various other um, methods, mostly by looking at the gravitational influence of the black hole on gas or on stars around it. Um, and they tried to estimate the mass of the black hole. And these previous measurements actually really disagreed. So they had this gas dynamic measurement, which was three billion solar masses. We had stellar measurement, which was six billion solar masses. And the great thing about our, our result is that the, the shadow feature that we measure is really just proportional to the mass. So by measuring the radius of the shadow, we can measure what the, what, the, what, the, what the mass of the black hole is. And so we did that, and we got a, a mass which is consistent with this larger um, estimate from stellar dynamics. So um, we did it with um, many different, with three different methods. One of them was this image, um, imaging I talked about before. We also did modeling directly of the data comparison of the simulations, and all three of these methods gave us a, a mass which is um, in the range of this um, larger mass that we had before. So this gives us, um, not only have we, have we measured the mass in MA7 now, but we also have some idea that maybe um, this technique might um, be more robust than, than this technique, though. I think I mean, just to give a sense of scale, I really like this cartoon which showed up the day after our results, the XKCG cartoon. I don't think I had ever really appreciated, like I know the numbers of how big this black hole was, I don't think I ever really appreciated how big it was until I looked at this cartoon which shows to scale what our solar system would be um, if we put it in the middle of this black hole. Um, and so this, the whole image we're seeing is about as big, a little bigger than the, the furthest distance that Voyager 1 has made it to. Radius of the short shield radius of the black hole inside which you would not be able to escape. Um, it's 128. So it's a really big. Um, we're able to do a little bit more than just measure the mass. We're also able to infer a little bit about what the properties of this hot gas that are falling onto the black hole is. So we've been modeling these systems for a really long time, and we thought for a while that this um, that these systems are um, of, of gas around the black hole that's falling on, onto the black hole and, and heating up and emitting light um, are these thick donut accretion disks, um, which can go up to 10 to billions of degrees Kelvin. So as the gas falls onto the, onto the black hole, it heats up to these really insane temperatures um, just because it's releasing so much energy. Um, we think that also there are strong magnetic fields in these, in these disks that are, are turbulent and the gas is um, rotating around and going into turbulence and it's dragging these magnetic fields along and sometimes these magnetic fields can fall onto the black hole and launch these jets out to large distances. 
just like the one we saw in M87. Um, the way that people have explained the launching of these jets is that the magnetic field piles onto the black hole and, um, and launches them out. And so we want to test sort of this, this paradigm and like what can we learn about the particular um, features of this, of this plasma? What, what is its temperature? What is the magnetic field doing? Um, is the magnetic field um, in, the, um, in the disk here really what's launching um, the, the, the jet? So the way that we did this was by looking at a lot of supercomputer simulations. And this is actually what a little bit of I've worked on as well, um, is we have these simulations of material orbiting around the black hole. Um, we have the really unwieldy name, general relativistic magneto um, And these solve for the equations that are governing the evolution of the fluid um, and the, the gas and the magnetic field um, in the space time around the black hole as it gains energy um, due to gravity, as it's dragged along by the spin of the black hole. And we then look at what these would look like by tracing rays, um, by tracing light rays of emission or out uh, through this and picking up, um, picking up the light that they're emitting. And we see this, the sent, the, sort of this evolution of this um, disk of material and then also the central black hole shadow feature that we measured. And so what we did um, to analyze the issue results in the context of these simulations was we assembled a library of 60,000 of these um, different snapshots from these simulations. So we have a library of about 50 simulations, which is still not really where we want to be in terms of scanning the whole parameter space of what the system possibly could be like. But since each of these simulations takes weeks to run on a supercomputer, it is still a, a really good first start. Um, and we collected snapshots of them, of 60,000 of them, from, these, from this library. We compared all of them to the data to really get a sense of like what is the most likely um, simulation based on the snapshots that we can produce from it and comparing them to the data that we measure. And here's an example of, uh, of a simulation in comparison. So this is uh, a simulation image. What we would see if we had infinite resolution eyes on the black hole, we'd see this gas around the black hole, we'd see the shadow, we'd see this bright light um, called the photon ring of the emission around the black hole. Um, and if we run it through our same observation and image reconstruction analysis, here is what we would see. And so you can see that it looks pretty similar to, to the result we actually got, um, though not exactly the same, which isn't Surprising because you know this is a really turbulent system. Um, the exact details of what the image looks like would really be influenced by precisely what um, what um, blobs of turbulent material are appearing at any given time. Um, so we went through all this effort to try to fit the data and to try to figure out what um, plasma parameters were favored by our models. It actually turns out that almost all of our by tweaking some free parameters on all of all, all these models actually almost any of our simulations can match the image. This was like really frustrating and um, for a little while, but I think it led to this pretty deep insight that really what we are seeing in the EHG image is not set by the details of this plasma physics around, around the, the, the black hole. Really what we're seeing is just the size of this ring, which is set by the space time, by the mass <coughs> of, the, of the black hole and by general relativity. And so really, is we have the freedom to make basically within some range of um, plasma models that we consider reasonable to really make any of them produce this, this emission that we bent by space time to produce this, um, to produce this ring. So it's the space time that is dominating the image. Um, but we have this other piece of information to work with. It actually turns out to be really helpful in constraining um, the, the properties of the magnetic field and black hole. And so that turns out to be the fact that we know that M87 produces this huge jet. So we see this jet, um, we see the black hole here um, on really small scales, and we see that it launches this jet out. And hopefully um, the future, um, uh, future improvements to the EHT will actually be able to see this jet being launched at the black hole itself. Uh, really, we expect it to be like 10 to 100 times fainter than this emission that we're seeing. So um, our current instrument can't pick it up, but if we're able to um, and improve our telescopes over the next few years, we might be able to see this jet launched right here at the black hole. And so we know this is, jet is taking an enormous amount of power um, out from the black hole to large distances. And so our models better be able to do the same thing. Um, and so it turns out that when we apply the constraint that all of our models have to produce this jet with this huge amount of power um, and also match the EHT image, so we're, we tweak all the free parameters to make them match the EHT image, um, and then we say how much power is in the jet. Um, it has to be equal to this huge amount of power that we measure at large scales um, 
from the um, from other from observations of other wavelengths I'm going back for a long time. And it turns out that on all of the, the models that pass both constraints, um, only the only models that survive are ones where the spin of the where the um, energy in the jet is actually being taken out of the black hole, um, black hole's rotation. So it turns out that if you have a black hole that's spinning rapidly, you can actually take energy out, you can use the black hole as an engine, basically, um, and take this, this energy that's in the spin of the black hole um, by threading magnetic fields through the, through the event horizon, um, and you can extract this, um, this energy out and take it out to large distances. And so this turns out to be what we think is going on in, the, in this jet, is that this, this jet, which is, you see going out to huge distances, thousands of light years away from the galaxy, um, is really being powered by this comparably tiny engine at the center of the galaxy, um, which um, is, uh, the magnetic fields in the plasma are taking the um, energy in the spin the rotation of the black hole and, and pumping it out into this um, huge jet of material that we see on the large scales. And so the combination of the EHT uh, model constraining these uh, constraining the simulations and the, um, the this measurement of the black of the jet power really gives us that we think that um, the, the the jet is being driven by the black hole spin energy itself. And we, in addition, we can also measure the orientation of that spin, and we think that this black hole is spinning counterclockwise based on what how bright the um, emission is. That the, the emission is brighter on the bottom versus on the top. Okay, so that's basically the end of my talk. Um, I'm just going to say briefly the um, next steps that the EHT is going to take over the next few years. So one thing I'm really working on now is polarization. So the EHT is not just seeing the total um, luminosity emitted, it's also seeing the direction of polarization of the light. Um, so this will give us a whole another uh, large amount of information that we can work with to understand the nature of, um, of the plasma around the black hole. We also have, of course, the uh, black hole in our galactic center, which we observed and haven't yet um, released images of. Um, we're working really hard on that, and hopefully we'll have them out relatively soon. One of the things that makes that really complicated is that the black hole in the center of our galaxy is evolving very quickly, much, much faster than the black hole in the center of M87. Um, and so we see um, structures in this um, um, black hole in the center of our galaxy change on time scales of minutes instead of on time scales of months. Um, and so that makes um, taking a picture is really challenging. It's like if you're trying to take a picture of like a fast dog that's running really quickly in front of your camera, you'll get um, new challenges and artifacts that you have to, um, to, to deal with. And so that's what we're working on now. And then going into the future, um, we're hoping to expand this network of telescopes, add additional telescopes, and really see what I mentioned before, like the connection of the black hole in 7 that we our image to the jet um, that's launched um, near it. So we'll be able to, by adding more telescopes around the Earth, we'll be able to see more sensitively not just the emission right near the event horizon, but also the extended emission and, and map this jet and really understand the interaction between the black hole and its environment. Um, so that's the end. Um, this is a summary. We've captured the first image of the black hole in, um, the, in Galaxy M7. Um, we did this by combining a lot of different telescopes together into one instrument through years of collaboration work and developing um, these uh, backends, which enabled us to, to, to take data from each telescope and put it together. Um, we reduced this data from petabytes into uh, 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 raw data into kilobyte images. Um, and we do this with many different pipelines to reconstruct images in order to give us maximum confidence in what we're seeing in real. Um, and, the sim and simulations, um, we're comparing the simulations that we have to, to, to these images and to data suggest that the M87 in black hole is spinning and the jet is formed by the attraction of its energy and that the black hole in M87 is about 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun. So uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them.